It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here this evening to introduce our, uh, our guest speaker. But before I do that, I just want to thank Ari for her uh, rendition and accounting and recounting of how much struggle we have behind us and how much struggle we have ahead. And to have Hassed speak to us about why we do this is profoundly moving for me and I know for everybody in this room. We in the BCNDP take these issues very, very seriously. Of course, uh, temporary foreign workers' immigration policy is federal jurisdiction. I know Jenny and Don are working hard every day to protect and promote solidarity, to promote inclusion, and to promote social justice at the federal level. But Shane Simpson, our, our, our labor spokesperson, and I sat down with Mabel, and this is about how hard have you worked today, Alden, sat down with Mabel, and we all agreed that although there is no intrinsic jurisdictional connection between the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia and temporary foreign workers, it is all about temporary foreign workers and social justice, why the NDP came together in the first place. And so we appointed Mabel Elmore to be our spokesperson in Victoria for temporary foreign workers and social justice. And I just want to say that, as Alden said, every day Mabel asks, how much more can we do? And I have to talk to you. So, but on to the main event. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce uh, our accomplished, and I use the word advisedly, our accomplished guest speaker. Faye Faraday is a lawyer with an independent social justice practice in Toronto. She's engaged in legal and community-based research, provides strategic and policy advice on constitutional and human rights matters, and has addressed a wide range of issues relating to migrant workers, workers in precarious employment situations, women's equality, race and gender discrimination, and the rights of persons with disabilities, poverty and income security, homelessness, and the right to adequate housing. Ms. Faraday has represented unions, community groups, coalitions, and individuals. She, and she's represented her clients at all levels in all courts, including the Ontario Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada. Having graduated as the gold medalist from Osgoode Hall Law School in 1993, she has gone on to serve there as an adjunct professor teaching legal ethics. Ms. Faraday holds an innovation fellowship with the Metcalf Foundation, has, uh, whose mission is to help Canadians imagine and build a just, healthy, and creative society. She's a published author, a co-editor, a frequent guest speaker, and a lecturer. And as I mentioned, she's very accomplished. <laughs> I had the opportunity over dinner to talk to Faye about, I think, probably the two greatest accomplishments in her life for two boys and the challenges of being a mother and doing all of the work that she does each and every day. It is a great privilege to be able to introduce to you our guest speaker this evening, Faye Faraday. Bring this back down to Filipino level. Um, thank you, thank you, John, for that very generous introduction. Um, thank you, Mabel, for inviting me to come out. Um, I want to thank uh, Jane and Maita and Beth and Josie and everyone else at Migrante BC who's made me uh, feel so welcome here. But I especially I want to thank all of you, all of you who are in this room. Thank you for supporting the incredibly important work that Migranti BC does with migrant workers. Um, as, as we've already heard from, from Hesed, and as I'll talk about more, um, we know that there are many, many um, issues and, and challenges that migrant workers face. And one of the big ones is isolation the um, coming to a new country, working in isolated workplaces, um, not knowing um, where to get help. And one of the really key things that Migrante BC does is outreach to connect up with those workers, organizing those workers, building connection, building trust, building community, so that migrant workers can bring their stories forward, bring forward their experiences, so that migrant workers can advocate for themselves for change. Um, uh, bringing forward uh, a community of trust so that migrant workers can bring on these, um, these groundbreaking litigation uh, actions like, like Denny's and, and the other ones. But it's about building community together. It's about building solidarity. And that's what 
we're here for tonight. Um, so thank you for your solidarity in supporting Migrante DC. Thank you for your solidarity, not just tonight, but going forward from today, because there is a lot of work to be done, and we all need to be in this fight together. But what we have at this moment is a tremendous opportunity. I'm typically someone who's fairly, fairly bleak. Um, but uh, I see an opportunity right now um, for us to make real inroads on this issue. Um, the Federal Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Labor has announced that the government will be undertaking what, uh, what she has called a serious review of the temporary foreign worker program. Um, so this is an opportunity for change. And with that in mind, I think um, tonight what I'd like to do is just uh, look back and see where have we been, take stock of where we are now, and to talk about where will we go from here together. Um, where I'd start off with is saying that Canada has lost its innocence on the issue of temporary labor migration. We know too much now to close our eyes to what is going on. Right across the country, um, groups like Migrante, other groups working with migrant workers, researchers across the country have been bringing forward countless stories of the kind of explo worker exploitation that is absolutely common under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. We know too much to keep things as they are. But at the same time, over the last couple of years, what has been exposed is how quickly Canadians' fears for their own economic insecurity can be manipulated, can be fanned into hostility and racism and xenophobia. And so we know the risks, and we know not to go down that path. So while we have this opportunity for change right now, we also have the responsibility to choose how to act based on what we know. So what do we know? We know that labor migration doesn't just happen, that it takes an awful lot of complicated laws and policies that are enacted by governments, that governments choose to enact, in order to make labor migration happen and to happen in the way that it does. Employers demand access to a flexible, reliable, compliant, low-wage workforce. And in response, governments have chosen to enact policies and laws to facilitate that. They've developed the programs that deliver that workforce um, on terms that very predictably make, them worker, make the workers open to exploitation. There's, as you know, a number of different programs, and there are certainly variations between the details of how those programs run. But what we know is that they all share very similar structures that drive the exact same kinds of vulnerabilities to exploitation. Um, we know that for workers, living caregivers and other workers under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program, that the private recruitment system is very largely unregulated. Um, and that workers are paying thousands of dollars in illegal fees um, to, to get minimum wage jobs in Canada. They have taken out loans that are subject to extortionate interest rates. They come to Canada essentially in debt bondage. We know that under the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program that even though there is not that private recruitment, that workers have, uh, are subject to perpetual recruitment where every year their ability to return is dependent on getting um, a good word from their employer to be able to name them to come back. So a perpetual system of recruitment. And we have heard about the experiences here as UFCW has brought forward in its litigation about the blacklisting that's occurred when those workers have tried to exercise their constitutional right to unionize. So we know that right from the get-go, those terms that they come in on create a high degree of vulnerability that makes it very, very difficult, if not impossible, to enforce their rights to, uh, uh, to, to workplace standards, to the, the rights in their contract. Um, that's compounded, as you know, by the tied permits that, um, that Hesed and um, Alden have already mentioned, where you can only work for one employer in one workplace doing a specific job. Often housing is also tied. Um, 
And the uh, Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, um, a couple of years ago at the UN conference on, on development and migration specifically said that tying, this is a quote from him, tying migrants to specific employers encourages exploitation. We know this is true. This is not a mystery. And the results that we see um, are entirely predictable. We know about injured workers who are deported the moment that they are injured and no longer um, able to do what their employers demand. We know about the four in, four out rule where after four years years of labor in this country, workers are considered disposable and sent out of the country for four years. And we know they have no paths to permanent residence. What we have done in the labor migration system that we have chosen to build is create a revolving door, a revolving door that sends, that creates a working class without rights. Because we are talking about working class jobs here. Forget about skill levels, we are talking about class. That we've created a working class that is circulating in and out of the country without status, without an ability to enforce its rights, and without any voice in the democratic process that produces the rights that govern them. And it's relying on groups like Migrante, on the important work that they do, um, that you are supporting here tonight, in order to bring forward that information, to bring forward the stories of what is actually happening. So we know all this is true. But you asked, didn't we fix that? Didn't we do something two years ago in 2014? Has the world not changed? And the answer is um, basically no. The, uh, the federal government in, in June of 2014 introduced a number of changes uh, which were purporting to, uh, to fix the temporary foreign worker program. At that point, there had been a rising public demand that something be done in the face of this exploitation. And so the government introduced a policy under the banner, putting Canadians first, which was meant to, uh, to reform the system. Um, but it didn't. It in fact, made many things worse. What it did do um, is all of the reforms, virtually all of the reforms that were introduced at that point were focused on the first thing that labor migration policies do, which is control um, which workers, how many workers um, are allowed to enter the country to work in which industries. Um, and they said that they were doing that in order to protect Canadian jobs. But the fact is that the legal obligation to um, ensure that migration does not affect um, Canadian jobs was always there. It was always a legal prerequisite that employers show that they had attempted to hire Canadians in permanent residence and were unable to. And it was always a legal requirement to prove that hiring a migrant worker um, would have a neutral or positive effect on the Canadian labour market. The, the reality is that since um, the mid-2000s, there was a concern that no one was actually watching what was happening there, that there was insufficient supervision. And so the changes that were introduced, introduced in 2014 were largely about putting into place um, the administrative processes to ensure that the government was complying with the obligations under the law. So they have, in many ways, um, uh, uh, addressed the question of who is allowed to enter, how many workers are allowed to enter. But the question of what are the terms on which the labor is done and who gets to stay are the two areas where change has not been made in any positive sense and has in fact made things better, or made things worse that the terms on which labor is done still leave workers incredibly vulnerable to exploitation and the routes to permanence have been narrowed. When we look at what has, uh, what has been uh, done, sorry, let me just catalog the ways in which things have not got better. All the key structural elements that produce workers' precariousness that we know about remain in place, right? The work permits that tie workers to a specific employer, the fact that the t they are short time limited permits, um, the mandatory departure after four years, the failure to regulate exploitative recruitment practices, um, the fact that we have fragmented complaint-based mechanisms for enforcing workplace rights, which we know don't happen, that you can't enforce your rights when you have to come forward and you risk termination, which is the, uh, the experience when workers come forward. Um, 
What else is in place? There's a lack of protection for workers who do raise complaints. So if an employer is failing to comply with their labor market impact assessment that authorizes them to bring uh, workers into the country, that LMIA is revoked, but so are all the work permits that are under it, right? So coming forward to identify an abuse in the system leaves workers worse off. Um, and we know that that's still in place, and there are still uh, no pathways to permanent residence for almost all workers who are coming in as working class workers. The second thing is that new elements have been introduced that actually make that precariousness worse. So the work permits that workers have are shorter in duration. They're only one year long rather than two years long. We know that uh, with the recruitment fees that workers are being paid, it typically takes two years to pay off a recruitment fee. And um, that in order to actually make the, the, uh, the journey uh, in four years profitable, you've got to be able to stick it out for four years. But if the permits um, end every year, that revolving door spins faster. The precariousness of having to renew your permit um, over four years instead of having just one renewal means that the pressure to comply with any demand of your, your employer is heightened. Um, there are new application fees that have been introduced on the LMIAs, $1,000. Um, those are meant to be paid by the employer. They are often being um, downloaded onto the, to, onto the workers themselves, so the recruitment fees are going up. That's another $1,000 right there. Um, the government introduced hard and declining caps on the number of migrant workers that can be present in any individual workplace. Um, and we know that uh, the, the Living Caregiver Program has been completely reconfigured. The promise at the heart of that program was that if living caregivers did their two years of service, all of them were entitled to apply for and receive permanent residence. Now that promise has been decoupled. So the number of work permits that can be issued in any year for caregivers is unlimited. It's entirely responsive to employer demand, but there's a hard cap on the number of, of caregivers who can actually get permanent residence. Any caregiver coming in now has no idea whether she'll be able to actually get permanent residence, right? That promise is broken. Um, and all of this was introduced in the context of a government discourse that shifted the focus away from um, the contributions, the economic and social contributions that migrant workers are making in our community. It was introduced um, in a discourse that shifted the focus off of the widespread worker exploitation that we're seeing, and instead it was uh, introduced in a context where the discourse reframed migrant labor as a threat to Canadian labor. Right? All of that is a highly toxic mix that makes uh, workers much more precarious than they were. So did they fix things in 2014? Absolutely not. Um, what's the common thread in all of this? What the common thread is, is that choices have been made, that government policy choices have been made that deliberately construct migrant workers as precarious, that um, engage in an act of commodification of labor, a dehumanizing of of migrant workers. We know that this drives, these are policy choices that drive an erosion of rights that subject migrant workers to incredible levels of control by employers and recruiters and enable those people to profit from their precariousness. All of those were active choices. But the thing with policies and laws is to the extent that we choose to create them, if we don't like the exploitation that we see, if we don't like the outcomes, choose again. Right? And this is our chance to choose again. What we have now is a moment uh, to build security together. Um, in this opportunity, will we choose permanent insecurity or will we choose decent work and decent lives for everyone? We need to directly confront the values that are informing the choices that our governments are making. We need to reject the normalization of temporariness and precariousness. Instead, we need to rebuild a robust permanent immigration system that enables workers of all classes to arrive here with permanent status.
We know that if you're good enough to work, you're good enough to stay. We need to build a system that recognizes the importance of family. The um, federal government has touted the value of family reunification in its new uh, approach to immigration. But we have a temporary foreign worker program that is absolutely premised on family separation for prolonged years, periods of years. It's premised on a system that uses family se separation in an instrumental way to drive circularity, to ensure that migrant workers will leave. It is absolutely the antithesis to um, a family reunification policy, and that needs to change. Migrant workers are not units of production. They are full human beings who are connected to communities and families, and they need to be together. And we need to reject sacrifice zones. Right? By which I mean, I'm borrowing from Chris Hedges on this, and what I mean when I talk about sacrifice zones are zones where we say that it is okay to create a two-tier labor market, where some areas of work we are going to relegate to, um, to low-wage, low-right zones that will be permanently staffed by people with temporary status. That must end. That has been a core part of our temporary foreign worker program. It's something where um, that uh, uh, undermines our general social policy to, uh, to ensure that everyone has security in society, that everyone has access to decent work and decent lives. To create these low right, low wage zones is intolerable in our communities. And in all of this, in affecting all these changes. We've written, I've written a number of reports that have detailed recommendations. You've heard um, from, uh, from uh, Hesed and from uh, Ari about specific changes that need to be made around uh, eliminating tied permits, eliminating the four and four rule, ensuring that there's security for workers. Um, but in all of this, we need to go forward with solidarity. We need solidarity against uh, across all the different streams of migrant workers. Whether you've come in under different programs, it's the same uh, kind of vulnerability that's being created. We need solidarity amongst people who are documented and people who are undocumented. We need solidarity amongst migrants and the labor movement and civil society. We need solidarity amongst migrants and those with permanent residence. And we need solidarity not just because we need to be good allies, but because this is all the same fight. This is all our fight, whether we are migrants or not. The neoliberal agenda that drives all of us into deeper precarity is part of the same story, whether it's fragmenting jobs into uh, precarious, casualized work, whether it's working full time uh, but still uh, falling below the poverty level, whether it's um, about a just-in-time workforce that absolves employers in the state from obligations to train and to retrain and to, um, to have uh, sustainable careers. It is an erosion of the commons and an erosion of the common good. And we need solidarity transnationally. Labor migration programs at their foundation depend on maintaining the deep structural inequality between the global north and the global south. And we need to acknowledge Canada's role and how our temporary foreign worker program plays into that system, right? That it's our demand for labor that helps sustain labor export policies at home. Building real security means building security so that migrant workers aren't forced to migrate, so that people have a choice to stay home, right? So that there are sustainable economies in all of our communities so that people truly can choose whether to stay, to go, to return. In closing, I just want to say that uh, I, uh, I visited Baha'i Migrante uh, this afternoon, and it's, it, you heard from, uh, from Ari, it's a wonderful story about how the, this community has come together um, and, uh, and created this home. It's a wonderful space where people can come together, a safe space to meet, a safe space to create art, to have um, uh, 
a, a base for a social life. There are youth committees, there are seniors committees, there's groups working with, with migrant workers. It is a wonderful, rich home. It is a home that, um, that we all need. We need somewhere where we can be together, we can work collectively, and we can be safe at home. And I want to, that's what I imagine, that's what we can do together on this journey. When we think about what we need to build together, we need to build that safety, that security for everyone, so all of us can have decent lives and decent work. Thank you so much for your, your